not that long. <laughs> so, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm James Pasiewski. I'm assistant professor in the Quantitative Methods program in Ed Psych. Uh, thank you all for coming. And it's uh, really my pleasure to introduce my colleague in education psychology, Dr. Kevin Coakley. Uh, Kevin, in Ed Psych, holds the uh, Oscar and Ian Mousy Regents Chair in Educational Research and Development. He's also a professor in, in the Department of African and Afri African Diaspora Studies, as well as director of the Institute for Urban Policy Research and Analysis here at UT. Um, Dr. Coakley's CV is really too hefty to, to <laughs> start to summarize here, if you actually want to hear from him. Uh, but so I thought I would just highlight one thing that that I think is uh, particularly inspiring for junior faculty like myself and uh, students, uh, which is that uh, his his work, in addition to focusing on uh, producing academic research, producing academic scholarship, really looks beyond uh, to to also drawing on his research and uh, expressing his perspective to a broader audience. Right? So by writing op-eds and engaging in this uh, really a broader public dialogue about race in America today. Um, today, uh, I understand he's going to be talking about really questions about how our academic institutions are configured and the, the political dimensions of how research is done and how the sausage is made. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Coakley. All right, we're good. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right. Please forgive my tardiness. I was just um, saying that I, I was off campus at, at a business meeting, and I was like, oh, my God, I have a talk at 10 o'clock. I've got to, like, get here. People are probably waiting for me. Um, so um, if I'm a bit out of breath and winded and sweaty, that's, that's why. Um, so I, I want to thank you all for inviting me here. Um, I'm going to, uh, when I was asked by James to give a talk, I thought to myself, what do I want to talk about? Um, I know that oftentimes people will um, go over their research programs, and, and certainly I have you know, several talks like that that I can give. But, but rather than do that, I thought that I would talk about um, something that I'm particularly passionate about, and, and that is the politics of doing ethnic minority research. And I'm a, I'm a counselor psychologist, and so certainly my, my frame of reference is through the discipline of psychology, but I think the larger points that I will be making in this talk really transcend um, disciplinary boundaries so that, you know, if, regardless of what field you're in, if you're doing work that focuses on ethnic minority issues, I think that there, there will be much of my talk that will be salient for you. So, in terms of the um, overview for the talk, um, I'm going to talk about hegemony within psychology. Um, then I'm going to move to talking about the continued marginalization of ethnic minority research. And as, as a psychologist, I'm also very um, metric driven. So we're, we will talk about traditional metrics of impact as well as alternative metrics of impact. Um, we'll talk about the difference between impact versus selectivity and then finally end up with a conclusion. Okay? You good with that? I hope so, because that's what you're getting. <laughs> All right. Let us begin. So what do I mean by hegemonic psychology? Hegemonic psychology uh, refers to the sociopolitical context that marginalizes and devalues ethnic minority psychology. And, and I, I want to give you some really personal examples. And I, and I probably should have prefaced this by saying that, that Parts of my talk will draw from my own um, experiences here at the University of Texas. And you know, now I'm at the point where, you know, sort of being a full professor, I don't care. I can say what I want. <laughs> I, I can say what I want to say. I can call out people as I need to. And so um, that's what I'm going to do. OK. Uh, so I received, um, there was an email by the former chair of the psychology department. And to give you some context, I am the advisor for an organization called the Student Circle Chapter of the Association of Black Psychologists. And one of the things that I've sort of committed myself to doing is really mentoring um, ethnic minority students and trying to get them professional development experiences that they oftentimes do not uh, receive. And 
I was trying to uh, help them receive some uh, resources to attend the Association of Black Psychologists annual convention. And of course, you know, that was going to mean receiving monies from the psychology department. And they'd had, as I came to find out, some pretty negative experiences with the psychology department. And so there was an email sent by the former chair, and this is what the email said. Quote, there are very few faculty who actually study ethnicity, race, or cultural issues, referring to psychology. One reason is that these are not central issues in the field of psychology. Several of us address these topics in occasional studies, but they are not the primary focus of research. Right now, the majority of our faculty would be considered experts in neuroscience, cognition, and perception, which reflects uh, Mr. Typo here on his part, that trends in several <laughs> top programs. As you have seen, there is much better research on ethnicity and race going on in sociology, in education, and African and African diaspora studies than in psychology. Okay? You're, you're comprehending this, right? Okay. He goes on to say, quote, but there is another way to think about diversity in the psychology department. In the last few years, we have been hiring an increasing number of African American and Hispanic researchers, scientists of color, who are doing internationally recognized research. My vision is that psychology, like biology and other sciences, will become an increasingly diverse department. This is a different dream than what our discipline should study. And this individual and I went on to um, say that in his ideal world, um, they would hire you know, faculty of color who were essentially sort of people of color on the eye side, but for all intents and purposes function no differently than the rest of the white faculty. And I heard this directly um, from you know, uh, this individual's mouth. And so clearly for them, studying race, ethnicity, culture within psychology um, was not um, appropriate and there was not a space carved out in the department to do so. So it was no surprise to me then that African American students and I suspect other students of color um, had difficult times in that space because they were essentially given the message that if you are interested in these sort of topics, this is not the place for you. So very personal story. Um, I was promoted to full professor in 2013. And to kind of give you a little bit of context, uh, I, when I was hired here in 2007, I was hired 100% in the Department of Education and Psychology. Um, a, a couple of years after that, um, we uh, at the university created a, a Department of African and African Diaspora Studies Department, otherwise known as Black Studies. And I was asked um, to have a joint appointment. Now, I, I was concerned um, about doing that, not because of the discipline, because I, I've always had an intellectual um, allegiance to black studies, but I was concerned about what that would look like in terms of promotion, you know, being located in two different colleges, College of Education, College of Liberal Arts, and as I understood it, there would be two um, different processes that I would go through concurrently, and that's not a very common experience. It's, it's bad enough going through one experience, <laughs> um, but to go through two, um, I, I, it gave me pause, but, you know, I said, you know, I, I'm committed to this intellectual project, so I will do this. Well, in the college education, so in, in my department, um, I received a unanimous vote at the department level. I received a unanimous vote at the college level, smooth sailing. Um, with my African and African Diaspora Studies affiliation, I received a unanimous vote at that departmental level. But then at the college level, the College of Liberal Arts level, ran into some problems. Um, the Promotion and Tenure Committee in the College of Liberal Arts is, is, is a lot bigger. It's liberal arts, and so there are 20 people on that committee. I think here in the college education, we probably have about, what, about five or six or something, more roughly. And so you have a lot of different disciplines, um, you know, economics, history, sociology, anthropology, the languages. So you have all these different disciplines, you know, sort of essentially voting on people f from disciplines that they uh, might not have very, very much familiarity with. And, and so I was informed that I had gotten a negative vote at, at that college level. Um, the vote, if I recall, was something like eight um, in support of my um, promotion to full professor, 12 against. And this shocked the, the dean of the College of Liberal Arts, who, who was also a psychologist. He had attended all the meetings. He had attended the presentation of my dossier and thought, and as he sort of um, explained it to me, he thought I had a slam dunk case. Um, so this news was conveyed to me, and it threw me into an existential, existential tailspin. Um, it was the first time throughout my career that I had ever received any sort of negative feedback about um, my 
my academic identity. Um, it caused me to regret having that joint appointment because this was the worst case scenario that I had imagined. Um, long story short, the, the dean, as deans you know, have the power to do, um, overturned that vote uh, at the college level, um, recommended that I be promoted, and I was promoted. Uh, so yay, happy ending. But um, in our debriefing, uh, I, he shared with me sort of what happened. And I want to kind of share with you so part of that discussion. So he said that, and th these were his words, that there was some methodological bias that had taken place during that meeting. And that um, there had been questions raised. Uh, I, I don't do experimental work. I know s several people do. Um, my work is correlational. And um, there is a hierarchy within psychology. And experimental is considered to be um, the sort of creme de la creme of, of research methodology, and, and, and understandably so. And so there had been um, concerns expressed about methodological um, limitations. And this, and, and I, I should also add that the person who was leading the charge um, against me was a psychologist, as it <coughs> turned out. Um, so that was an interesting footnote. And then there were some questions about journal selection. And the dean characterized it as journal bias. He said that what had been pointed out was that there had been um, too many articles in, in what had been called so-called low-impact journals that focus on ethnic minorities. Um, I've, I've provided you some examples here, Journal of Black Psychology, Journal of Multicultural Counseling and Development, Culture, Diversity, and Eth Ethnic Minority Psychology, Journal of Black Studies, uh, again, I'm you know, sort of um, interdisciplinary, uh, Mental Health, Religion, and Culture, and the Journal of Diversity in Higher Education. And, and, and this was a, 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 an interesting um, critique or criticism of me because if you, you know, if you looked at my uh, resume or CV closely, you know, by my count, I had eight articles that would be considered in, article, in journals that focused on ethnic minority issues, and I had nine that did not. And in terms of some of the recognition that I had received, um, I had been recognized as being among the top ten contributors um, in multicultural psychology journals, but equally importantly, um, I had also been recognized as being among the top 20 contributors to the Journal of Counseling Psychology, which is um, a quote unquote mainstream, you know, sort of top tier journal. Um, so I had both of those distinctions, and yet the criticism was I was publishing too much in those, you know, sort of ethnic minority journals. And the dean, of course, disagreed with that. And so this led me to sort of really reflect on what happens to folks you know, who do work that focuses on ethnic minority issues. And, and one of the things that I sort of concluded was that journals that focus on ethnic minorities um, tend to be disproportionately recognized as low impact. And, and I've always been sort of um, hypersensitive, well, sensitive slash hypersensitive to, to how people talk about these, these journals. I was at a conference, um, and I remember there was a presentation and the authors presented on publication trends within cross-cultural um, psychology and ethnic minority psychology. And they were comparing data from two different um, time points. And they had found that individuals who did work on cross-cultural or ethnic minority issues um, continued to be underrepresented in the literature, uh, particularly in what they call top-tier journals. But during that presentation, um, they kept using the phrase, these low-impact specialty journals, low-impact specialty journals. And at the time, I happened to be the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Black Psychology. And while they were m saying these low-impact specialty journals, they had the Journal of Black Psychology up there. Um, you know, so a brother got mad. I'm like, L you know, that's, that ain't right. I mean, like, you know, and, and, and the individual who was doing the presentation was also an ethnic minority. Um, and so that was adding salt to the wound. And so I, I've always been very sensitive about how we talk about these journals that that are, are more favorable to the work that some of us do um, and why they are referred to as these sort of low-impact specialty journals. And so um, what I've sort of concluded over my 20 years is that publishing ethnic minority research in, in so-called high-impact top-tier journals is not simply about publishing the highest quality, most rigorous research. Now certainly it does involve that to a certain extent, but don't be uh, naive to think that that's the only thing that, that is at play. Uh, it reflects editors, associate editors, and reviewers' expertise, as well as the values and biases that they bring um, into their reviewing any manuscripts. And this is often reflected in, in the racial and ethnic composition of editorial boards. Uh, I don't know about you, but for me, you know, certainly when I, especially when I was in, in the grind and you know, trying to sort of, you know, get a lot of things out, one of the first things that I would do um, when I was targeting journals would be going to the editorial board and looking to see who's on the editorial board. 
Um, I, want, I wanted to know the, the composition, and I wanted to know what kind of work did they do, um, because that, and, and while not a perfect sort of in indicator, it, would, it was a usually a pretty good indicator of whether, one, they even possessed that expertise to fairly you know, review your work, and if there were any sort of potential biases that um, they might have that you may be aware of, um, that would be something that, I, you know, as an author, you would want to be aware of and before you would submit your, your manuscript. And these journals that are um, high impact or top tier don't always reflect the most impactful ethnic minority research either. And th that's part of what I want to um, talk to you about and provide you with some examples. So what determines impact? Um, impact factor. And let's, and I know that most of you probably know this already, but for those who are less familiar, I just want to give you a quick primer on, on impact factor. Impact factor. Um, measure of the frequency in which the average article has been cited within a particular year or period. Um, typically, we, we look at two-year um, spans. Um, sometimes we'll use five-year spans as well. Um, so the number of and so the formula, and I'll show you a, a real example in a moment, but the, the formula is essentially the number of citations uh, received in the year of articles published in that journal during the two preceding years, then divided by the number of articles published in that journal during the two preceding years. And, and, and essentially what happens is that the impact factor is viewed more or less as a proxy about the relative importance of a journal in a field. You know, you see this number, this, this metric, and you immediately sort of make certain judgments about whether that is a quote, so-called good journal or not. Um, certainly that's, that's what we see in, in psychology and I think probably in other um, disciplines as well. Um, now, so what is a high impact um, number or metric? And here, there's quite a bit of variability. Um, Backer and Wickers have suggested that a high impact psychology journal is anything that's greater than four, and that a low impact journal is anything that's less than 1.5. Um, psychology Wiki, interesting good source, uh, suggests that a high impact psych journal is greater than two, a medium impact um, journal, psych journal is between one and two, and a low impact journal is less than one, all right? And again, these are really basically sort of subjective um, impressions. There's no, there's no um, rigorous or empirically validated way of saying this is equals a, you know, a high impact journal. This is completely, you know, sort of subjective. Um, and interestingly, none of the top 50 high impact psychology journals um, focus on race, ethnicity, or, or culture. So there's already a built-in bias. If you are interested in doing that type of work in, in my field and you want to get published in a so-called high-impact journal, then here we go. None of those journals really focus on that work. Now, why should you care? And I, I added this last night. Um, I've, I've given versions of this talk before, but I added this last night because I wanted to make sure you understood why this is important. Um, how many of you have heard of academic analytics? Okay, a, a, a couple of you. Um, what is academic analytics? Um, academic analytics, it provides universities something that's called a faculty scholarly productivity index, which is a metric designed to create benchmark standards for the measurement of academic and scholarly quality within and among research universities. Okay, that you know, probably sounds Greek to you, like, okay, so again, why should we care? Well, if you were to go um, to the provost's office here and, and, and other places, you'll see that, and, and they don't advertise this very much, but they use this academic analytics and they basically have information on virtually every you know, faculty member on campus and they create a, a metric, a number that somehow captures what this, um, this the impact, the productivity of uh, various faculty and they use this metric to, to do that. And it supposedly answers the following questions, you know, how do we compare to our national benchmarks as a university? What are our peers at other universities doing? What do we need to allocate our resources? Are we collaborating effectively? Are we winning our share of federal grant dollars? Are we researching cutting edge topics? How many honors and awards have we won? And what you know, I'm especially interested in would be the last two points. Is our work being cited enough? And are we publishing in the right journals? And all of that sort of goes into the academic analytics. And this is just sort of a, a quick example, but you can see here, uh, and these are not real names, but you can see what academic analytics um, actually does, and it, and it, and it gives you um, points for each of these categories, and then again, it, it generates a, a single score, and then you are then sort of ranked um, and compared to not only um, people within your um, university, but to people across um, the country in different universities. 
And as you, as you might imagine, this has been very controversial. Uh, one, because the administration is, is pretty closed mouth about it. They don't really talk about it a lot. Um, you know, we as faculty know that they use this, um, but we don't know exactly how it's being used. We don't know exactly sort of what, what how they're calculating it, although we have some idea. Um, but it's generated quite a bit of controversy um, in academia. So I, I wanted to give you some examples of these, um, and I put in quotes, um, specialty journals, many of which, you know, based on at least the criteria that I just shared with you, would be considered low impact journals. So, and Journal of Black Psychology, uh, Asian American Journal of Psychology, so on and so forth. So you can read these, um, the names of these journals, and I have the impact factors highlighted. Now, I will add that the Journal of Black Psychology is interesting because we were very excited when um, we crossed that threshold of one. And again, there's nothing, there's nothing magical about the one, but for, for many of us, we were like, if we can just get above one, then that will give us some sense, semblance of, quote, unquote, respectability, even though there was, there's no objective empirical criteria to determine, is that a good thing or not? Um, and just by way of comparison, if you're, you know, again, I think for, for psychologists, this will be particularly salient. You know, if you're in different fields, um, Journal of Development of Psychology, or I'm sorry, the Development of Psychology has an impact factor of well over three. Um, the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology has an impact factor of over five. Uh, the American Psychologist has an impact factor of over six. Uh, the highest impact factor journal within psychology would be Psychological Bulletin, which has an impact factor of over 16. So there's a, you know, quite a bit of variability within psychology. There are many different subspecialties within psychology, um, but it's, it's really for those subspecialties to determine what they consider to be sort of good, top tier, so-called high impact uh, factor journals. But, but we can see here that if you're publishing in journals that focus on race and ethnicity, based on the criteria that I just presented to you, these would be, all be considered so-called low impact journals. And by show of hands, how many of you, in terms of your own sort of professional goals, your goal is to publish in a low impact journal? Raise your hand. <laughs> like, like, when you think about like, I wanna, I wanna get published, especially for those of you who've, who maybe haven't published before, your goal is to publish in a low impact journal. Show of hands, show of hands, okay, I see one, two. <laughs> I don't, I don't, don't see very many of you. So, so when you frame it that way, that doesn't sound very appealing, does it? Why would anyone want to publish in a journal that is considered by that discipline as, as being low impact? So, so the language itself is very problematic. Um, and, and, and if you are interested in ethnic minority populations, um, and again, within psychology, we have as an example, a um, very well-known study by Sandra Graham in 1992, uh, where she had looked at uh, how many studies within certain journals in psychology even focus on ethnic minority issues, and she found the numbers were, were abysmally low. Um, there was a follow-up study done by Imado and Sh uh, Schiavo, and they found that between 1990 and, and 1999, less than 5 percent of articles in six prominent APA journals studied ethnic minority populations. Yes? Did that paper get published? <laughs> <laughs> Not in an APA journal. <laughs> Not in an APA journal, exactly. Uh, I'm happy to give you that citation afterwards. <laughs> but uh, uh, as, a, as a side note, it's important to define or operationalize what do we mean by ethnic minority research? Because I mean, there is some debate about what even constitutes ethnic minority research. Um, they defined it as where ethnic minorities were the focus of the study or analyses were conducted by race in multi-ethnic samples. I could quibble with that a little bit and get into a larger sort of philosophical issue about whether that's truly ethnic minority research, but that's another lecture for another time. But you can see here from the numbers that regardless of what populations you, know, you might be interested in, they're not typically well represented, and at least in this representation of APA journals. And non-APA journals had a slightly higher representation of uh, folks of color, but not much. And so the, the questions that I would um, invite us to consider today is how do we measure the impact of ethnic minority research? Does publishing in a high impact journal ensure a greater number of citations, because that's, that's the assumption, right? If you publish in these high impact journals, then that definitely means that you're gonna be cited more frequently. Um, can traditional metrics fairly and accurately measure this impact? And are there alternative ways to measure um, the impact of one's work, okay? And again, I, I like to use myself as an example because it, it helps to make clearer 
why uh, I'm asking these questions and why I believe there are some problems. Um, but before we get there, journal impact factor. So again, the frequency with which the average article has been cited in a particular year. Uh, the, we typically look at two-year and five-year windows. And I want to give you an example from the Journal of Black Psychology. So this is the formula um, that is used. Okay. So the citations in 2015 to articles published in 2014, and you can see that the um, the sum for the numerator is 33, uh, divided by the number of articles published in 2014 and 2013, where the sum is 44. And so our 2015 journal uh, uh, impact factor was 0.75, which you know many people would say that it's, it's definitely under one, and so not good. And so for a period of time, we were we we were in this um, sort of range of you know 0.7 to 0.8, 0 0.9, and it was it was very frustrating for me as an editor because I I saw every manuscript that you know I had to prove every manuscript that was published. Um, we had an, a rejection rate of probably eight, um, 80 percent. Um, I knew that we were publishing high quality um, studies, but we could not get over this hump. And so people who were, you know, um, graduate students or um, t untenured faculty who were going up for promotion, you know, you had to sort of um, put together your, your dossier and, and you have to sort of defend or justify um, the places that you choose to publish. And I, I'll never forget. There was a, a very prominent um, scholar at the University of Michigan who was going up for promotion and had some problems uh, because some of her research had been published in the Journal of Black Psychology. It didn't matter that she had also published in Child Development. It didn't matter that she had published in, you know, in other prominent journals, but the fact that she had more than one um, article published in the Journal of Black Psychology, a journal that was considered by her department as a low-impact journal, made her case not a slam dunk as it, it, as it should have been. She did, now, saving grace is she did eventually get promoted, but it was not without a great deal of you know, um, anxiety and, and, and fight. Uh, so you can see this was the impact factor trend. And I, I will add that our most recent impact factor, um, and you can see you know, the numbers here again, and we got over that magical hump <laughs> to 1.66. And, and I, I have to say that it was, I have, it, it, I have mixed emotions about this because this, so you know, you, you know how it's calculated. And so you know that um, this was calculated once I had already, or computed after I had already stepped down. Um, my, I have to say that you know, my work hopefully contributed to it. But, but it's frustrating because you, know, you see this number and you're like, yes, you know, we, we, we got over that one threshold. But in my mind, the quality of the articles is not any better than when we were at 0.75 or 0.8. But I know that in, in these spaces, this is sort of what matters for so many people, and they see this number. And even, even then, and a previous editor of the Journal of Black Psychology, Sean Yutzi, um, you know, said something that was really um, you know, provocative. And he said, look, the, the problem isn't you know, the impact factor number. The problem is the word black. <laughs> and he was very clear about that. You know, it, the, the problem is that we're, you're publishing in the Journal of Black Psychology. And so he was very sort of um, clear, at least in his mind, that that was the issue. But nevertheless, we did get over that magical um, one hump. So I want to give you some examples of, of my own publication record, and I want to sort of show you where I've published. I want to show you citation counts to see if the questions that I'm asking are, are being asked for um, good reasons. All right. So my, most, my highest cited articles. Uh, now, my highest cited article um, is in the Journal of Council Psychology, which is in our high impact journal. Um, you can see, and I, I did this last night, so I'm always, whenever I give this presentation, I'm always updating it. So I, last, I literally went last night and updated the numbers. Um, 397 citations for this article published in the Journal of Council Psychology. My second highest, um, an investigation of academic self-concept and its relationship to academic achievement in African-American students. Um, published in the Journal of Black Psychology, 314 citations. Uh, my third highest one, published in the Journal of Multicultural Counseling and Development, another so-called low-impact journal. My fourth highest one, published in the Harvard Educational Review. Now, I, I should have put an asterisk by this because while this is uh, it's not a psychology journal, um, the Harvard Educational Review, at least by psychology standards, would not be considered to be a high-impact journal. Although in education, it's very prestigious. It has a long history. Um, I'm very famous and well-known scholars have published in the journal. And so within education, it is considered I think, education scholars correct me if I'm wrong, but it is considered to be a very good journal. But by psychology standards, in, in terms of impact factor, it would not be. So you sort of have that, that tension. Um, 
Measurement and Evaluation in Counseling and Development, which is a, a journal uh, published by the American Counseling Association. Um, again, um, a journal at least considered by counselor educators as a very good journal, um, uh, a very rigorous journal, uh, but not a journal that is a high impact journal, but still a lot of citations. Um, and, and so on and so forth. And so, you, so again, I, I've highlighted the journals that are journals that focus, that are either focusing on ethnic minority issues or that are so-called low impact journals. And you can see the number of citations that those articles have received. And so seven out of the 10 highest articles that I've published are published in journals that are characterized as low impact journals, which sort of begs the question. If, if the goal is to publish research that gets used, that gets consumed, that gets cited, and it's published in these so-called low impact journals, isn't that what we want? Or are we more concerned that it's simply being uh, published in a so-called high impact journal? And you know, it's interesting because one of the things that people don't talk about enough is you can get published in a high impact journal and not get cited. So is, is, that, is that important? Is that, you know, you, you, you publish in that journal that has a three or four or five or higher impact factor, yay, um, but it never gets cited or it rarely gets cited. Um, is that more important or is it more important to get cited, um, published in a low impact journal that is used and consumed quite a bit? Um, and we, we don't have those discussions, I don't think. Certainly, I haven't seen that discussion um, within psychology and I suspect it probably hasn't taken place in other disciplines as well. So I want to move away from the impact factor for a moment and talk about H-index. So by show of hands, how many of you are familiar with the H-index? Okay, a, a few of you. Uh, and again, you know, psychologists, we are just consumed with metrics, and so we, we, we are just <laughs> consumed with it. The H-index, um, it is a measure of the cumulative impact of a researcher's publications um, that attempts to measure the, both the quantity, the number of publications, um, as well as the quality of, of publications, which um, is operationalized here by the number of citations. Um, an H index of 10 means that a scholar has at least 10 publications that have been cited at least 10 times. And you can get your H index through a number of different um, venues, Google Scholar, Publisher Paris Software Programs, the Web of Science, et cetera. Now, one thing that should be pointed out is you can be cited quite a bit, um, but not for good reasons, right? So if you've published a crappy study, methodologically flawed, um, data, I mean, just horrible, that, I mean, just, and people cite you as an example of what not to do. Or they cite you as an example of this is bad science. So, so you have to sort of take that into consideration. We don't, we don't know why people are being cited. So just, just a caveat to, and, and that happens, right? I mean, certainly I have cited people, um, and I've cited them because I'm critical of them. And perhaps you've done the same thing. But a citation is a citation is a citation. It still con contributes to that citation count. And so we don't think about that level of what the citation count actually means. So, Alternative metrics of impact, and these are starting, I mean, I would say probably over the past few years, we're seeing uh, pushback against these traditional metrics, and alternative metrics have been introduced. Now, again, they are not um, perfect, and they are not meant to um, replace the traditional metrics, but they are intended to sort of provide more nuance to helping people better understand the impact of your work as a scholar. Um, so altmetrics um, are measures of research impact that allow researchers to understand how their work is being discussed and shared and saved and read and reused by s other scholars and the public. So basically sort of trying, we're trying to broaden the definition of what we mean by impact. And again, altmetrics are meant to, to complement but not replace the traditional metrics that we've just talked about. And there are various examples of, of, alt, of these sort of um, altmetrics. Um, how many times you know, your work has been mentioned on, on Facebook, on Twitter, or on online news sites? Um, how many times your research has been downloaded? Um, full text articles, uh, software, et cetera. How many times your work has been uh, talked about in blogs or other online forums? And again, now, we, we're very clear that all of this can happen and it does not speak to the quality and the rigor of your work. And so we're not suggesting that. But what we are suggesting is, is that if, if your work is being engaged, it's being consumed, it's being talked about, that should mean something. Because at the end of the day, don't we want our work to be consumed? We don't, wa we don't want to be just talking to each other because that's too often what happens. You know, as, as scholars, we write in scholarly venues that no one else is going to read other than other you know, scholars. And even then, only a select number of scholars that's within our particular field, that's within our particular subdiscipline. So we want to really broaden the discourse so that more people have access to what we know. 
And so these alt metrics, alternative metrics, are, are a way of, of beginning to do that. Um, again, another example, I received an email, it's probably maybe four or five years ago, I received an email uh, from the editor of the Journal of Multicultural Counseling and Development. And she was very excited because my article had been featured in an ABC News story. Uh, I had written an article about the imposter phenomenon, which is research that I've been doing over the past five years. And my article was featured in an ABC News story about Viola Davis. She had just won the Oscar. And she talked about how she struggles with the imposter phenomenon. And so in this story, as they're sort of talking about her, her experiences, they cited a study that we had done here at the University of Texas. And the article had received an altmetric score of 18 after being mentioned. And now it has received an all-time, what they call one of the all-time high altmetric scores of 111, where a score of 20, and again, I don't know how they determine what's high or low. This is just what was communicated to me. But where a score of 20, um, was considered to be high. And as, as you'll recall, the Journal of Multicultural Counseling and Development is a low impact, you know, journal. In my mind, this is pretty impactful. I'm, I'm pretty proud of this. Um, and yet, I would not have, you know, if I were going through the um, tenure promotion process, I would not presumably get credit for the impact of this particular piece of scholarship. Um, and, and in my mind, this is very impactful. Other alternative metrics of impact, um, some, and you've, you've probably noticed this, at least in, in psych discourse, which is the database that, that psychologists and other um, and disciplines use, um, there's been something new, a new metric that's been, I think, introduced probably a couple of years ago called Plum X met Metrics. And you can sort of see it because it has this nice, it's like a little purple, um, I, I don't know where the little, uh, symbol came from. It's like this purple symbol that you'll see attached to all of your um, publications. Um, and it categorizes research metrics in five different categories. Uh, citations, of course, which is the traditional citation count. Um, usage, um, which is, you know, how many times is your particular um, article being downloaded? Has it been clicked? How many times has it been viewed? Um, mentions, um, the, the measurement of activities such as news articles or blog posts about your research. Are people talking about your work? Um, captures, um, how many times have people sort of gone to your study and they've bookmarked it or they've indicated that it's, it's a favorite piece that they want to return to. Um, social media, um, how, again, how many times is your work being sort of tweeted about? Is it, you know, do you get Facebook likes, et cetera? And so what this Plum X Matrix does is it, uh, it takes all of these different sort of, um, you know, outlets into consideration and it uh, creates a metric. And so, as I sort of begin to wind down, I want to, I want to invite you to, con to really think very critically about the difference between impact versus selectivity. And I argue that selectivity may be a more appropriate way to evaluate these so-called specialty or low impact journals. Um, what is the acceptance rate of the journal that you are submitting to? Um, what is the rejection rate? Um, I mentioned previously that um, when I was editor of the Journal of Black Psychology, we had a rejection rate of 80%, that, which is, you know, we're not accepting any and everything. Um, I think that's important to note. Um, what would be considered competitive acceptance and rejection rates um, for your particular areas? How low should acceptance rates be? Um, how high should rejection rates be? If you were told to try to publish in a journal and the rejection rate was 95%, um, are you gonna feel pretty good about your chances of getting something accepted in that journal? Now, from the university standpoint, they're like, yes. That shows, you know, that's a certain level um, of, of, of prestige that, that we want all of you to sort of achieve. But the reality is that um, that's, if, think in terms of um, statistics, it is possible but not probable that you would get accepted in that, right? Um, so in conclusion, how do we measure the impact of ethnic minority research? And, and I would say, while the context of this talk certainly is, is on ethnic minority research, this really goes to other areas as well. And I've had conversations with people who are in maybe so-called um, niche or niche areas um, that these same sort of issues are, are salient. Can traditional metrics fairly and accurately measure the impact of your work um, as a scholar? Does publishing in a high impact journal ensure a greater number of citations? I, and I hope that, um, at least using myself as an example, I've persuaded you to reconsider that assumption. And are there alternative ways to measure the impact of your work? And 
how do we measure or how should we measure the impact of, of ethnic minority research? I would say that research that addresses a relevant, timely, and or understudied issue that impacts ethnic minorities, that's impactful. That's important. That's a question that should be asked. Research that provides new insights and understanding of some aspect of the ethnic minority experience, that's important. That's impactful. And again, these are very sort of qualitative questions because you can't capture them in numbers, right? Research that generates buzz, a buzz in the media or social media. You want people, I think, talking about your work and people outside of the academy. And most importantly, research that is used by the community. Because what good is it to do all this work and it doesn't impact the lives of the people that we claim to want to help? And again, as a psychologist, and I am a quantitative psychologist, um, I, don't I don't categorically dismiss numbers and metrics. I mean, that would go against sort of, you know, sort of who I am. So citation counts and impact factors, they have some utility. And I, and I, I don't want you walking away thinking what Dr. Cook said to totally dismiss that. I, that's not what I'm saying. They, they, they have some utility, but they are not a panacea. Um, and they, like any attempt to try to assess or evaluate a scholar's work, they have limitations. And I just, all I'm saying or suggesting is that we should acknowledge their limitations. Um, you can publish in high impact journals, as I said, but that does not guarantee that it will be cited frequently. Um, high, cit high citation counts, as I said, do not necessarily mean that research is good or, or being cited for positive reasons, as we talked about. And bias in citation patterns, where scholars who publish in these so-called high impact journals, they tend to primarily cite other scholars who publish in these journals. And so the good and relevant research that's being published in these so-called low impact journals never get published, never get cited because people aren't even looking at them. And, and, the, and I remember, you know, being so frustrated because I would, I would do this as a hobby. I would just go and look at people's citation counts and, and citation patterns and who's being cited and who's being cited where. I'm a nerd. Um, <laughs> and it would, always, it would always infuriate me because I would see studies from, you know, the Journal of Black Psychology that should have been cited in some of these, you know, sort of high impact journals, never cited. I'm like, well, why aren't you citing our work? This is directly relevant to this particular topic. And they're not citing it because they don't, the Journal of Black Psychology isn't even in their consciousness. It's not a, you know, why would it be? Because they don't, you know, if, because they've been told and socialized that there are only certain types of journals that you should even consider worthy of, of, of citing from. And so these are some of the inherent biases that exist that, that I have been trying to get people to, to acknowledge and to discuss more openly. Um, so, in conclusion, um, Altmetrics and Plumex um, are promising examples. They certainly have limitations. Um, the limitations include um, these measures, they measure attention, but not, not necessarily the quality of the work. And so certainly we don't want to minimize that quality and assessing quality is, is important, but they certainly measure the amount of attention that your work has gotten. They are subject to manipulation, um, as are um, all metrics. I mean, in fact, if I could just sort of um, back up for a moment, one of the things that I, I did not mention to you about the impact factor is that journals, impact factors are, are relatively stable. You know, you look at them over a period of time and they tend not to fluctuate greatly. So when you see tremendous um, fluctuations, you know, say, let's say going from an impact factor that's below one to an impact factor of four within a year, that is statistically improbable and, and something is going on. And in fact, what, what is probably happening is that the editor has given the message um, to the editorial board that when you are reviewing manuscripts, um, you know, you need to make sure that they are citing from the journal. Now, that, that's appropriate. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But what I have heard happen is, what happens sometimes is that editors will t make authors um, cite manuscripts that may or may not be directly relevant to their work uh, on condition of getting publication. All right? And, and, you know, and, you know so, sometimes it's explicit, sometimes it's not. But think about it. You are an author. You want to get published. And so you're reading that, that action letter. And the letter suggests, you know, you might want to consider citing this work from our journal. Are you going to cite it? <laughs> even, if, even if the citation itself is linked to your work is, is, is questionable or not very direct, more often than not, you're going to cite that because you want to get 
published in that journal. And so there have been situations where journals, editors have been manipulative. And you know, I won't call any names, but what happens is when, when that happens, and when there's a tremendous jump in the impact factor, it, it draws attention and it becomes red flagged so that you could get in trouble as a, as a journal editor if that sort of pattern is, is noticed. But, but all metrics can be manipulated, and so um, we shouldn't penalize these alternative metrics um, because they are no different than traditional metrics in terms of being manipulated. Um, who is using or citing our research? Um, we should be asking those questions. Um, and these questions are more qualitative questions. They're not quantitative questions, but they are very important because we, again, we want our research to be used. And sometimes, you know, that cannot be assessed in, in a number. And how often is research being cited in other specialty journals? And it goes back to my original point that there is very good research that's being done in these journals, but they are not being cited by so-called mainstream journals, and that is an inherent bias in the, the publishing process. That's all I got for you. Peace. Questions? Yes, Dr. Watts. So what kind of advice would you give for people, for faculty and departments, or what type of messaging they should give to their chairs or deans about this issue to educate them about how to sort of understand impact factors of HM indices? Well, I, I would I would tell chairs, and I would, I would frankly tell anyone, that to not, to not exalt the impact factor to this sort of elevated sort of status, that to understand, you know, sort of, again, sort of what I talked about, to understand some of the limitations of the impact factor. Um, and again, and I, I don't want to, you know, sort of, you know, sound like a broken record. I, I'm not... I'm not dismissing the impact factor because the reality is in these spaces, the impact factor matters. I mean, it, it, it does, um, more so for certain disciplines than others, but it matters. And so, but just to, to recognize its limitations, and I think most importantly, department chairs need to become more familiar with these, some of these outlets that would be considered non-traditional or not the traditional sources of journals, outlets that, that some of us are more familiar with. The other piece of advice that I, I would give uh, junior scholars is, you know, to, to publish everywhere. I mean, when I was on a tenure track, I wanted, I wanted to prove that I could publish in these so-called high-impact journals, but I also wanted to publish in journals that I thought would, would be more responsive to the sort of work that I did. And so to make sure that there would be no questions raised, at least when I was, you know, going from assistant to associate, I published broadly. I published in all of those different journals to try to cover my basis. And so I would, I would encourage people to do just that. Um, you know, to try to publish, you know, in what is considered to be so-called high impact factor journals, just because, I mean, that, that is just the politics of the environment that we're in. But to not limit yourself to those spaces, particularly when those spaces may be hostile to the work that we're doing and may not be, frankly, the best or most appropriate venue for those spaces. Uh, so very related to that, not just like where you're publishing, but who you're citing. So yeah, there's a lot of early career researchers in here, myself included. So you talked about um, almost like an echo chamber effect of like, these researchers who just cite other researchers in similar journals. Yes. What advice might you give to people up and coming into that, not to get stuck in that echo chamber, to make sure they're citing all these specialties? Well, well, I mean, you, you, you answered your own question. question. Don't, don't, don't do that. <laughs> No, yeah, no, just just don't do that. And 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 you know, I I mean I have to remind myself of that when you're writing a paper, make sure that you're citing from those sources that don't oftentimes get cited. I mean, and it's easy to cite from you know those high impact sort of high visible journals. It's easy. Um, it takes more work to sort of cite from journals that are not as recognized, but whose work is equally as valid and important. Um, so just as, as an author, making a, a concerted effort to cite broadly from all of the sources that are relevant to the work that you're doing. You mentioned one of, uh, one of the alt methods is potentially, or metrics, is potentially like how much buzz or attention. And I'm, I'm trying, I'm thinking about what impact that could have on the science itself in, instead of, you know, chasing a high impact journal. Um, you know, 
someone in a researcher is chasing Facebook likes or uh, Twitter well, traffic. And I, you know, just like the sensationalist kind of thing that that encourages about like, well, it turns out that, so, you know, and some amazing thing that is silly, but that's always, that's like what gets clicks. And yeah, so, so could you talk about absolutely. that concern? Um, and, and certainly that, that, that is a problem. And, and again, I, do, I don't want people leaving this talk thinking that, that that's sort of what I'm advocating um, for the very reason that, that I think you are suggesting. What I'm saying is, look, that sometimes the work that we do is, is undervalued, it is underappreciated, it is not really understood um, because it's, it's focusing on a population that frankly your mainstream doesn't care about. And so when that work gets recognized, gets acknowledged in spaces that aren't typically recognized by the academy, I think that means something. Now, should you chase um, these sort of venues to get Facebook likes? No, I don't, I don't think you should do that because I mean, I, I agree with you that you, know, you, don't want to, you don't want to compromise the integrity of the, the process and, and the work that we're doing. But I don't think there's anything wrong with looking in addition to the traditional sources of, of, of recognition, looking to other sources or that, that would also suggest, perhaps, that this work is important and meaningful and is being impactful in some way. So again, just in conjunction with, but no, you should not chase those, because I mean, when you, people do that, and we know that that's problematic. So uh, this is kind of related to, to the last questions. So I feel like there's, there's sort of this interesting moment right now in psychology where there's a, growing recognition that a lot of work coming that has appeared in super high impact so-called mainstream journals uh, in in some disciplines in psychology is actually actually there because it's sensationalist but kind of shoddy and it's only it's only appearing there because of kind of pretty questionable methodological practices and so so I'm wondering if like I'm just trying to make sense in my head how that how that moment uh, intersects with the concerns that you're raising about the disparities in, in uh, where ethnic minority research uh, appears. Well, I, I can answer the first part of that. I mean, it, because I'm thinking about a, an example here at, at UT. So I've been on the Promotion and Tenure Committee uh, for the College of Liberal Arts for the, for the past five years. So I, there's a certain irony about that. The same committee that rejected me, I have now been serving on for five years. So. I love that, that irony. But, but there was a case in, I guess I can say this because I think it's public knowledge, there was a case in sociology where there was a very controversial um, promotion case that was going up. And the individual's research um, was, some would characterize it as being homophobic, as being anti the LGBTQ community. And you know, has gotten a lot of attention, has gotten a lot of um, funding has been published in, in spaces that sociology would consider to be, you know, high quality, top tier journal spaces. But I think if I understood your question, when people went back and looked at that work more carefully and more critically, they saw that it was methodologically very flawed and that it had been sensationalized because of the, the, the moment of the times that we're living in. And, and that had in some ways um, exalted or put that, pl that particular individual in a space um, that was perhaps undeserving, and it, it made for a very difficult decision in terms of promotion. But, but to your point, you're absolutely right. Sometimes work can get published in these high, sort of uh, high impact, top tier journals, but when it's looked at more, and, and it's very sensationalist, it, it captures a lot of attention, but when it's looked at more critically, then it's um, determined to be very methodologically flawed. Um, and, I'm, and I think you asked me about the implications for ethnic minority. Um, work, um, and, and in that particular case, it wasn't you know an ethnic minority issue, but it was certainly a, a, a top. But you know, it's a, a, a population that is a, a particular special population. So I, I think the same probably would would hold across different groups. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so. Um, it can be really like demoralizing <laughs> to know all of this. Um, especially, <laughs> especially, yeah, I mean, when you, when you, you know, like especially when your research interests and publication interests are ethnic minorities, and then you know, migrants within those minorities, and you're like, okay, so basically, you know, one's gonna read. 
or very few people. So I guess my question is, as you know, as students, what can we start doing to kind of um, increase our um, not not impact factor in like the number, but just how many people are researching that? How I'm sorry. How how can I? How can we increase our impact? How can we? Well, well I, I think you know, for for graduate students, I mean. You, you're probably, I mean, I, I'll, I'll tell you how I was thinking as a graduate student, um, which may or may not be relevant, but I wasn't asking questions about the impact of my work. I just wanted to get published. Like, I, I mean, like, and I didn't care where I got published. Um, I just wanted publications, and because and, um, I, I didn't really understand at that level, at that time of my development, I didn't understand these sort of issues and these sort of questions. The only thing that I understood was to get a job, I need to have some numbers of, some, of publications. And, and not that that should be the only thing that you should be concerned about as graduate students, but I would say be concerned more about that. Impact will follow. I mean, that, when, when you're talking about impact, you're talking about the lifetime of, of one's sort of career. You're at the very beginning stages of that. So I, I wouldn't be as concerned about the impact, um, but, but that said, you do, I assume that you're doing work that is, is, is meaningful to you, that, that has, that has import, importance in your own life or in the life of the communities that you're interested in. And so just making sure that when, when you do this work that those communities get access to it, that you sort of you know, make sure that you spend time um, sharing the work, sharing the knowledge with those communities. And, and, and again, I, I'll go back to what I said at the very beginning. If you're doing this work, you're getting published, you're getting accolades from the academy, but no one in the community knows anything about it, then you know, has it been for naught? So I think as students, you can still do that work, that make sure that you're, you're sharing the knowledge and that you're giving other people that you're, con that, that you're concerned about access to the knowledge that you've generated. Uh, Dr. Copley, you said that uh, Journal of Black Psychology went from 7.75 to 1.6. Mm -hmm. uh, and you said it wasn't the quality of the articles for the reason for that. So uh, have you reflected on why that went up? Yeah, yeah I have. Um, because we had noticed, if I had given you like a 10-year, 9 or 10-year range, there had been one other previous time when the journal had um, gone from under 1 to, I think, 1.56 or something. And I went back and I looked at what articles were being cited, in, you know, to sort of see, try to figure out what was going on. And in, in that particular case, um, it just happened to be that in this two-year span, a lot of articles had been published on racial identity, on perceived discrimination, and topics that are very popular in black psychology, and those articles happen to be cited quite a bit. Um, so I think that that's typically what happens, that within any given two-year frame, there could be certain articles that are published that, that capture the attention of, of researchers uh, in a way that they end up being cited more. So I think that's probably what... What ended up happening? That makes sense. That'd be my interest. Not a special issue. <laughs> well, exactly. People, people, people do special issues with that in mind. Like, what, what can we do that we know would generate a buzz and hopefully increase the numbers of citations? Yeah. I think we're just about out of time. So let's thank our speaker one more time.